Right, everyone. Right, everyone. It's time to get started today on a, a brief history of life on Earth, um, which is a bit of a challenge given that I'm going to turn this down a little bit. Uh, given that we only have 50 minutes, um, but I'm going to give it, you a very brief overview of how life on Earth has differed over the, the history um, of our planet. Um, and also, because it's really the most fun bit of this topic, I think, I will spend quite a bit of time talking about mass extinctions and how those mass extinction events have really resulted in big changes in the dominant life forms on Earth. Okay. So, first of all, how do we know about the history of life on Earth? Fossils. 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 They're really fun. Hopefully everyone should own a fossil, at least one. Um, and so they give us a sense. It's time to quiet down now, please, everyone. Um, so they give us a sense of how life has changed through time. And really the most interesting fossils have been in the most recent time because that's when we've had complex life. And um, so fossils can be preserved in a number of different ways. Either the hard parts, the shells of organisms or the skeletons can be preserved. Or you can sometimes get the imprints, sort of carbon films um, left behind in, in sort of rocks. But does everything that ever lives or ever lived, does that always get preserved? No. So one thing that we have to battle with is that our fossil record, while it's enormously useful, is not complete. Okay? It's one of the challenges when we look back in time. And obviously, when do you think it's going to be easier for us to look at? Further back or more recently? More recently. More recently. OK, thank you. So my first iClicker question of the day. So thinking about fossils and rocks and sedimentary rocks and what we talked about way back in the first bit of the course, what can fossils not tell us about uh, life on Earth? So have a quick look. So can they tell us about what species existed, what types of environment that they existed in? Can they tell us anything about environmental changes that may have driven evolutionary change? Um, can it tell us exactly where and how life first originated? Which one of those can't we get from fossils? <coughs> okay, a couple more seconds. Let's take a look. So everyone's quite on the ball today, absolutely. So while fossils can definitely give us an idea of what species existed, how diverse they were, what they looked like, they can also, if when we look at the rocks, give us an indication of where exactly those uh, animals lived, whether they lived in the deep ocean, whether they lived on land, whether they were perhaps sort of tropical or, or, cold, or cooler environments. Um, and they can also give us some idea of things like the changes that uh, may have happened that have driven evolutionary changes and also mass extinctions. So the fossil record and the geological record in general has been really helpful in allowing us, uh, or vital even, in allowing us to understand how life has changed on Earth. But the one thing that it really can't help us with is exactly when and exactly why and how life first originated. It's one of our big mysteries still, and I love coming across these big mysteries still in science. So let's have a think about the early Earth, because we, the Earth as we see it today is really only sort of the most recent um, sort, of evolu or sort of example of uh, how life has been on Earth. Because really, if we look at the very earliest time on Earth, so somewhere between its sort of formation at 4.5 billion years and maybe about 3.8, 3.9, then the Earth was a really different and really hostile place. So early on, our moon was much closer to us. It's been gradually moving further away. And we had big magma oceans because the Earth was still cooling down from form its formation. We had big sort of asteroids and meteors and comets colliding with the Earth still and remelting chunks of uh, rock whenever it solidified. So it really wasn't a terribly sort of friendly place for life to, to form and exist. Um, and towards the end of this period, then the Earth had cooled down 
quite substantially. We were beginning to get sort of continental areas. Um, we were beginning to get uh, sort of water forming our early oceans. And we think that the very earliest sort of signs of life, they're not fossils, but the earliest sort of signatures of life in our record were probably about 3.9 billion years ago. So life has been around for a really large part of Earth's history. Okay? But obviously the challenge in trying to find that very earliest life is even recognizing it to begin with. Because obviously if we fall across a fossil at the beach and it's a shell or a dinosaur or something like that, it's pretty obviously a fossil. If we want to go and look for the earliest life, which is going to be really simple, really small, it's going to be really difficult to find that life preserved in the geological record. And then the next era on Earth, the Archean, which is sort of 3.9 to 2.5, then is sort of starting to become more recognizable in terms of what we see today. We had our oceans, we had volcanic activity, plate tectonics got going, we built up a lot of our continental area, um, and now we really did get sort of life get going. So maybe around 3.5 billion years is our, really our earliest uh, signs of fossils. And they weren't really very dramatic. They were things like these that are labeled on here called stromatolites. And we still see these today. Off the coast of Australia, we can still see these. And really, they're just sort of little colonies of cyanobacteria. Um, and they have lots of filaments, and they're a bit sticky. And so they trap sediment. And they build these little columns. And really, those are our first sign that we can see the definitive life on Earth. And we see them right from 3.5 billion years onwards. Okay. So somewhere in between those times, or somewhere early on in Earth's history, we developed this life, okay? But it is still somewhat of a mystery. Um, our earliest organism was way, way simpler than bacteria. We think of bacteria as really simple, single-celled organisms, but they're still really quite complex in terms of the chemistry that goes on in terms of their, their makeup. And so really, it's sort of where do we draw that line between sort of complex biomolecules and life itself? It's a really interesting question. And so if we think about the three things we need to happen for life to really get going, we first of all need to produce things like amino acids, so complex organic molecules, okay? And that's sort of chemosynthesis. So we need to make these small organic molecules. And once we have things like amino acids, these different organic molecules. We need to somehow get them to clump together to form larger um, organic molecules. So that's biosynthesis, this combination of smaller, less complex uh, molecules into more and more complex ones to make up things like proteins that are very important. And then the last thing that we really need for life as we know it to really get going is we need to develop those really quite complicated chemical processes that allow us to metabolize, that allow us to reproduce. So things like RNA and DNA. And these are the challenges because this is obviously a very complicated um, sort of system. Um, and so how on earth do we get these to happen? And so that's the big question. Is it just that, say, one in every trillion Earth-like planets could have this sort of sequence that happens to have produced life? Or is there something that wherever you have an Earth-like planet, and you have this sort of chemistry going on, then sooner or later, boom, life just happens. Okay? And that's a really interesting question. And that's why we're so interested in looking at Mars, and why now people on Earth are even trying to work out whether we all really did evolve from this one simple organism to begin with, or perhaps life sort of was, was created at different times um, on, on the early Earth. So we have some theories, but really they are, well, we have some ideas, I should say, not theories, because remember, theories are something that we're a bit more certain about. We have some ideas about how life on Earth might have uh, originated. Um, and so here's our first idea, and it's been around for a while, and it's one of the most popular, and that is the primordial soup idea. I like this idea of primordial soup. Um, and there was this guy early in, I think, the 60s and 70s that said, well, what happens if we take the composition of the early atmosphere on Earth, which, remember, was really different. It was lots of carbon dioxide. It had sulfur dioxide. It had sort of ammonia and other things in there. What happens if we add energy to that? So what happens if we perhaps had lightning strikes and electricity going through this mix? And he found that he could make really quite complicated 
um, molecules and organic molecules by, by doing this. Um, and so this is where the primordial soup idea came from, that the products of chemosynthesis, for example, by lightning strikes, sort of combining things in our early atmosphere, or by impacts, providing energy, created these sort of chemosynthetic products, and these collected in surface waters. And then perhaps if those surface dried out, the, if they collected at sort of the edges of, of land and they dried out a little bit, or perhaps if we added energy by volcanic heating or solar energy, or perhaps if we could collect those on the surface of clays, then perhaps we could start um, uh, so that sort of biosynthesis pro uh, process of getting these simple organic materials and combining them into something more complicated. But there's issues with this, um, and, and it's a, a bit of a challenge to prove it one way or the other. And then at about the same time, we found these things. We found these hydrothermal vents down deep in the ocean. Remember, that was the time when we were really exploring the deep ocean. And we thought, oh, well, this would be a perfect place to try and develop our very earliest life um, because uh, we have nice also organic molecules that can form on the surface of minerals around these things. And if we can, we also have this sort of heat coming from these hydrothermal vents and we have lots of really sulfur-rich uh, water around there. Um, and these things would allow more complex reactions to happen on the surface of these minerals. Um, and so perhaps this could be a place where Earth really originated. Um, and this is sort of an increasingly popular one. Um, and people have been looking at things like our, our DNA and saying, well, if we look back at some of the simplest and earliest sort of organisms, then they all seem to have this heat tolerance. So perhaps life did evolve in this sort of environment because it's nice and protected from the surface where we had these um, impacts uh, from meteors um, and it's also protected from the quite vicious solar radiation at that time. So this is a really interesting idea as well. And then the last one is a bit out there really, um, but it's this idea that when we look out, if we look at these sort of gas clouds out in space, we can see that actually it's not just sort of silicate dust or, or gases, we can actually see quite complicated um, organic molecules out there as well. And so the, this is the idea of sort of panspermia is that um, the life is sort of seeded to different planets uh, from uh, space. But there's some real issues with this one, which is that whenever you develop really complex organic molecules, they can be broken down pretty easily by solar radiation, especially up in space, um, where that's sort of usually uh, sort of stronger. And also, how would those biomolecules really su survive sort of the, the process of landing on Earth if they're coming down from space? Because they get very heated up during that time. So there's real issues with this one. This one I don't think is a strong contender. But anyway, it's still an open idea, and there's still lots of really exciting and interesting uh, research being done on this. But however it happened, it happened, and we ended up with life on Earth. Um, and this is our little sort of geological history along the right-hand side here, going right back from sort of 4.5 billion years when the Earth had first been created um, up to uh, today at the top. And you can see that we separate these things into different times. So the Hydean isn't on there, but it should be. And then we have the Archean, Proterozoic, Phanerozoic. I don't want you to bother about remembering those things. Okay? If you ever need to know again, you can look it up. Okay? Um, but what I would like you to be aware of is that once that first life did evolve on Earth, then it really was very simple. And it stayed simple for a really, 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 really long time. So for the first two billion years of life on Earth, it was really that simple prokaryotes. So remember, prokaryotes have no nucleus. Um, they tend to be small and much simpler. Um, and they're probably that life sort of stayed simple because of the restrictions imposed on it by the natural environment. Because even though things like photosynthesis was happening and that was releasing oxygen to the environment, that oxygen was basically um, reacting immediately with iron or with sulfur and oxidizing everything. Basically, the whole of the Earth was rusting for a, a couple of billion years before that oxygen could start building up in our atmosphere and in our oceans. And so if we think about those early organisms, they weren't able to respire because there was none of that free oxygen around. 
Instead, they were limited to fermentation, which is what happens uh, when we don't have uh, oxygen, and instead we produce things like alcohol instead of CO2. Okay? Um, and so that fermentation process releases a lot less energy than our respiration process. And so those cells were just a bit more limited in, in how complicated and how big they could become. So that was our sort of prokaryote world for, for 2 billion years, right up to 1.5 billion years. And then interesting things started happening. So then oxygen in our atmosphere really started building up before, sort of above really minimal levels. Um, it was still nothing like what we see today, but there was sort of free oxygen up there. And so respiration uh, could begin. And that allowed cells to become more complex. It allowed them to grow larger. Um, and there was more energy available in that cell. And so they could develop um, into eukaryotes. So where they had more organized uh, parts to their cells, such as a nucleus and different sort of organelles. Okay? So that was when our eukaryotes but still, it took a very long time before really interesting things started happening there as well. Okay? So up to maybe about 0.6 billion years or 0.7 billion years, we again just had these simple eukaryotes. And then we start getting interesting multicellular type organisms. So really, these are the earliest things that we can see that are complicated sort of animal type things that we would recognize. Um, and so they look a bit like jellyfish. Um, so, or soft corals or flatworms. This is what they might have looked like um, from what we can tell from the fossil record. But obviously, um, they're all made of soft parts, so it's quite difficult to find evidence for these in our fossil record. And really, this was just about 600 million years ago. So in terms of Earth history, this is nothing. This is really very, very recent in geological terms. Okay? And then at about 570 million years ago, Life really, really got going. We have what we call the Cambrian explosion. And uh, we started getting a whole uh, bunch of different sort of diverse species that represent more of the groups that we see today in, in the world's oceans and on land. Um, and the really interesting question is, why on earth did this happen at this particular time? Um, and there's still a lot of different ideas for why that might be the case. So things like, well, maybe sexual reproduction happened. And remember, sexual reproduction was one of the ways that we can really increase the genetic diversity in our populations. And so that may well have allowed evolution to happen much more quickly and allow this sort of explosion in diversity. The other things that might have happened is that oxygen built up to the point where we could actually now have things like calcium carbonate shells or phosphate sort of skeletons. Okay, so there are a couple of different ideas for that. But it's really from this point on that we start to see hard parts, so skeletons, uh, internal or external, in our uh, animals. And so now we get much more of a complete fossil record. We see much more of this preserved through time. Um, and then if we think about land, because until now, all of that life that was happening was happening in our oceans. Life was sort of, uh, the land was really this lifeless just rock. We had weathering, we had sort of rivers going in different directions, we had mountain building and everything else, but there was no life on the earth, on the, on the land. Okay. Um, and so life uh, 500 million years ago, so again remarkably recently, started to move from the oceans and colonize the land, and it colonized the edges first, and then it moved further inland. And if we think about the challenges for life as it moves from the ocean onto the land, there are some, some quite significant obstacles that they have to overcome. First of all, you need some sort of structural support. If you're a jellyfish in the ocean, that works OK. If you're a jellyfish on land, not so much. So we need some sort of structural support, um, whether that's for plants or uh, different animals. We also need some sort of mechanism to keep water um, in the organism and keep them from drying out. So again, a jellyfish in the ocean probably wouldn't need to worry so much about this. A jellyfish on land will be in much sort of greater danger of drying out, and we need that water for our sort of chemical, uh, sort of for our meta metabolic processes to work. We also need to be able to, to take in gases, so we need to be able to take in oxygen. And if you're uh, an organism that's adapted to removing oxygen from seawater, 
then ha you need to somehow adapt to being able to take oxygen from the atmosphere instead. So we had to develop ways of doing that. And also, we need a moist environment for the reproductive system. So different organisms have done that differently. Uh, so mammals, uh, we uh, have sort of internal uh, Re reproductive, we sort of grow our, our babies inside. Um, for birds and, and reptiles, then they have eggs, which sort of keep those embryos uh, sort of moist. Okay? So there were a number of different challenges that life had to face when moving from the ocean onto land. Okay? And so if we look at, say, the evolution of plants on land, then really our earliest plants were the really simple algae um, um, and also mosses that could, could sort of just move out of the ocean and colonize the edges there. Um, and so our earliest plants were seedless. They reproduced using spores, so things like mosses. Also ferns. Ferns were a big component of our early uh, plant life on Earth. Um, and then we evolved into things more like our conifers. Um, and so these evolved seeds, so we allowed, that allowed the plants to spread um, a little further and into more diverse habitats. Um, and then lastly, at about the same time that the dinosaurs were around, maybe in the Cretaceous, maybe 65 to sort of 100 million years ago, that was when we started having flowering plants, what we call angiosperms instead. Okay? Um, and these were more successful because now we can attract pollinators um, and so we have greater reproductive success. So this is really the sequence of uh, plant life on land. We had our early algae, mosses, and ferns, and then we had conifers, and then uh, today we see much more of our angiosperms, our flowering plants on land. In terms of our animals, the insects rule, okay? They are by far the most successful uh, uh, group of organisms that have managed to sort of colonize land, okay? So they were definitely the first to move onto land. So if you imagine these sort of hard-shelled anthropods running around in the ocean, um, they were able to more successfully and earlier move onto land, probably in the sort of form of centipedes or millipedes. Um, and they had this advantage because they already had an exoskeleton, so that was, uh, that was helpful in managing to protect them. It gave them structural support, and it also allowed them to, to keep in moisture. Um, and uh, they also were small, which helped them out a little bit as well. Um, and so even today, they are by far the most diverse and numerous group on, on the planet. So our little millipedes are ants. And remember I said in the, the early part of this sort of history, that it really was the age of insects. We had those gigantic spiders. We had sort of car-sized millipedes. Um, it was really the age of insects. But... Other things happened, so we also got vertebrates moving onto land, and that's sort of what we are, we're vertebrates. We have a spine, we have a backbone. So the first animals to do this were little fish. So even today we see this little mud skipper fish, which is very cute, um, and it's an amphibious fish, so it can live in water, but it also has, it can sort of skip along uh, with its uh, feet, and it can breathe in the atmosphere. So this is sort of a good example of some perhaps that early organism that may have made it onto land, okay? Um, but those, that, that earliest organism involved, evolved into our amphibians, so we, those amphibians are still really tied to water, okay? So think of like frogs, they're still very tied to water. Um, but then we also evolved reptiles from those, and reptiles aren't so much tied to water, uh, things like iguanas are lizards. They can uh, even exist in deserts today. They're not as tied to water. And then lastly, we developed mammals and birds. Okay? So these are our different generations. We could think of really uh, the last 500 million years or so in terms of three ages. We had sort of insects and mosses and ferns. Then we had reptiles, our dinosaurs, and conifers. And then we had mammals and birds and our angiosperms. So we have three different, very distinct times in uh, the most recent 500 years. Um, and now we are the age of mammals, um, and we have uh, been very successful, partly because we have much more complex brains when they work. Um, we have faster metabolisms, um, so reptiles are often limited um, by sort of cold-blooded uh, 
metabolisms. And then we also have uh, very successful reproductive strategies. Okay, so I've talked for a very long time now. So let's see if you are listening. So can you put the following images into order from the oldest to the most recent? So if you uh, accidentally crashed your time machine in each of these times, which is the oldest and which is the more recent? Couple more seconds. Right. So let's see if uh, you'd be successful as Doctor Who or something like that. Oh, maybe. Not terribly. Okay. So the winner was C. So let's see. So A. What do we have? We have ferns. And what's hunting our small little reptile here? Giant spider. Okay. So A would definitely be the oldest. Okay. Then we have C, where we have our reptiles and we have our sort of conifers, our sort of pine trees. Okay? So B, uh, C would definitely be next. And then lastly, we have our terror birds. Okay? So B, we have our birds um, and we have more sort of deciduous and angiosperms. So C was the correct answer. It would go A, C, B. Um, and if you want to know more about this, I think these are really fun. So those images are taken from these little documentaries, which are like fake nature documentaries that the BBC produced. And uh, there's three of them. There's Walking with Monsters, which is uh, basically taking everything up to the dinosaurs. And they have a different little half hour program where they sort of show you what life would have looked like if they could have taken a nature sort of documentary crew back. Then we have Walking with Dinosaurs that sort of shows you some of the diversity at that sort of time. And then one of my favorites is Walking with Beasts which shows you the real diversity in terms of mammal life and uh, bird life that has happened since uh, the, the dinosaurs died out. And especially it has these gigantic, terrifying birds and really uh, interesting stuff. So if you get bored in the next couple of weeks, then take a look at this because they're really fun. Okay. So let's talk about extinctions because the reason that we see those changes in terms of the dominant life on Earth is because we've had these catastrophic events where a lot of the existing life on Earth has died off. And there's lots of different reasons for that. So over, different, over time, we definitely see evolution of new species. But at the same time, we see the extinction, we see the dying off of other species. And usually, they more or less balance out. Okay? Um, and, but probably our background extinction rate is about maybe 15 extinctions per year. But that has been very different in the past um, due to different conditions and due to just the different diversity of life that existed. Um, and so an, if enough species become extinct over a small enough time, we call this a mass extinction, a really dramatic change in the life on Earth. And we have what we call the big five. Okay? And they're all in this last sort of 500 million years or so when we have a much better fossil record and we have more diversity of, of creatures. Um, and so you probably know the most recent one, the Cretaceous Tertiary, which is 65 million years ago. What died off then? The dinosaurs. But we also have things maybe back sort of between 200 and 300. We're going to talk a little bit at the end of today about the Permian-Triassic mass extinction, which is really the closest that Earth has come to wiping out all life on Earth. It was not a particularly good time. Um, but you can see that there's been a whole series of these events um, for a variety of different reasons. So, what can cause mass extinctions? If you wanted to cause a mass extinction on Earth, what would you do? <laughs> block out sunlight, that's a pretty good way. And what's a, a way that we could try and block out sunlight? What could happen that could block out sunlight? Oh, I'm getting too many answers at once. This is a good thing. Okay. Yell louder. Volcanoes. Volcanoes. 
volcanic eruptions on a really, really big scale are a really good way of, say, blocking sunlight, of putting lots of nasty gases into the atmosphere. What caused the extinction of the dinosaurs, supposedly? A meteor, potentially. We're going to talk a little bit more about whether that is true or not. So things like a big impact uh, event could cause a mass extinction. Um, anything else? So perhaps something changing with the ozone layer, and that's a really interesting one, and that perhaps is tied in, but it's really difficult to reconstruct for the past. Um, so that's a difficult one. Ice? Did someone say ice? Disease. Yes. Disease. Absolutely. Disease would be a really good one. Anything else? How about climate? Really dramatic changes in climate over a short time. So I have a collection of four, and I think you got more or less all of those. So first of all, impact events. What are these? These are large, whoops, large scale impacts of comets or meteors. Okay, um, and the effects of those are pretty devastating. Um, they uh, obviously impact with an awful lot of force, and they send out this enormous blast wave. Um, but they also ignite forest fires over a huge, huge area. Um, if they land in the ocean, they can send out mega tsunamis. We'll talk more about this in a couple of minutes. Um, we might set off uh, earthquakes or volcanic eruptions due to this enormous shockwave. The dust blasted into the atmosphere causes global cooling, and it reduces the amount of net primary productivity, which then has a knock-on effect for the rest of your food chain. Um, and also things like acid rain, if you've got lots of sulfur ending up in the atmosphere, you can generate some pretty nasty sulfur uh, acid rain, um, and also a greenhouse effect as a result of that. Okay. So how do we identify it in the geological record? Well, if there's a big giant crater, we can be pretty certain that there was a big giant impact. So that's the first thing we look for, a huge crater. But also there are some other signs. So for example, we get really unusual spikes of elements in the sediment around the world. So we see some things like iridium, which aren't usually found in big quantities in Earth's crust. We see extra of those. Um, we also see what we call shocked quartz. So quartz grains that have been exposed to really high pressures, and they fracture in very specific ways. And also what we call tektites, which are those things at the top right-hand side there, which are basically just bits of molten rock that cooled as they sort of fell through the air, and they sort of produced this sort of funny rounded pattern. Okay? And in terms of duration, it happens really, 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 very fast. Okay? Um, and so here's a little idea of um, how much uh, energy some of these impacts give out. Okay? So uh, has anyone heard of Tunguska? No? I'll show you a picture in a second then. This happened in 1908. It's the last really big um, meteor impact. Um, and it produced pretty significant um, damage. Um, and then if we go, sort of, we can look, if we add up the whole of the world's nuclear arsenal, um, it's about equivalent to some of the impacts. And the KT boundary, this, uh, this big impact which may have done in the dinosaurs, released enormous amounts of energy, probably 2 million times the energy of the strongest bomb we've ever exploded on Earth. So enormous amounts of energy produced by these things. Okay. So here's what happened in Tunguska. So Siberia, so there weren't very many people around, which is why it's a bit of a mystery. But it was in 1908, it was probably about a 60 meter meteor or comet, and it exploded 5 to 10 kilometers above the Earth's surface. Um, and it's probably equivalent to maybe a thousand times the Hiroshima bomb. And it flattened, completely flattened, like this, 770 square miles of forest. It's pretty astounding, the scale of these things. And that's just 60 meters or so. Okay. Um, have we had anything more recently, perhaps? Yes, we have. But where was it? It was this more complicated name. I think it's. I'm not going to try and pronounce it. Chelyabinsk, OK? And that was in February last year, when I was last time I was giving this lecture to my geology group, which is a little scary. It happened that night, OK? 
So this is uh, the big meteor that hit earlier this year. And you can see it, it produced quite a significant shockwave. It um, hospital, or I think uh, 1,700 people had to go seek medical treatment. Um, and again, it exploded high up in the atmosphere, maybe 20 kilometers up in the atmosphere. It was probably about 10 meters or so. Um, but again, it produced um, a really, really significant blast. Um, and it's, I think, one of the most recent big events that we've had. So there's a good 10 minutes of footage there if you haven't already seen it. Um, and the, the blast wave is pretty impressive to listen to as well. Um, so the dash cans in Russia are coming in useful again. OK. So that's the last sort of big meteorite we've seen. And it's nothing in comparison with what we've had before. OK. My second uh, thing that can produce a mass extinction is what we call flood volcanism. Um, or flood basalt eruptions. Um, and we may think of, sort of volcanic eruptions as very violent and explosive and everything else. But in terms, again, if we look back in geologic history, we've had enormous, enormous volcanic episodes. And what do I mean by enormous? I mean that you can cover more than 100,000 square kilometers in um, up to 10 kilometer thick lava flows in probably less than a million years. So you can imagine the effect that that would have both locally, obviously that's going to be devastating, but also globally if that's also producing at least even minimal amounts of ash. If you're thinking about the amount of uh, gases coming out while that's happening, um, it would not be a very pleasant place to be. So it can sort of, that, that dust in particular, aerosols, can block incoming sunlight. Um, it also uh, produces pretty nasty sulfur oxides that lead to acid rain. Um, lots of CO2 can uh, cause quite dramatic global warming. Um, and it also can reduce the amount of oxygen in our oceans, which is very bad if, for example, a lot of our life existed in the oceans at that time. Okay. So how do we identify it? We look and see if there's enormous amounts of volcanic lava flows in our geological record uh, for any particular time. Okay, so this is a little bit longer than our uh, meteor impact, so it can last up to a million years. Um, and so here, I just wanted to show you the scale of some of these. So we've had lots of different flood uh, basalt events um, in the history, and so those red areas there are the areas um, that are covered by these uh, basalt lava flows. And remember that basalt um, lava flows are really vis uh, uh, they have low viscosity, so they flow really nicely. So we're not talking about big explosions, but we're just sort of covering huge areas of land uh, with uh, lava flows. Um, sea level falls. If your life in the ocean, a lot of the really productive areas of our oceans are the shallow, the continent sort of edges. Okay? Um, and if you see very dramatic sea level fall, you can basically remove a lot of the habitat that your nice um, sort of shallow uh, life enjoys, and so you can cause uh, a, a mass extinction there. And that's sort of due to, say, ice sheets growing, which would cause your sea level to drop. But also plate tectonic activity can do that. OK. Um, and then also significant global warming or global cooling. So this has to happen fast, because if it happens slow enough, then life can usually adapt or keep going. Um, but if it happens on a small enough time scale, then life can't necessarily adapt, and you can see a species dying out. Okay? Um, so uh, just quickly, that we see, because we see this climate change, we see a really rapid change in the distribution of habitats and also the, the variety um, of those ecological niches. Um, and so we can see sort of collapse of uh, uh, diversity. Okay? So let's have a look at some examples, which are more fun. Okay? So once we know that there is a mass extinction, once we can look through the geologic record and see lots of stuff dying out, we need to work out why. And basically, you act just like a detective. You have to look at, well, what, or so basically who died. So what died and when, OK? Um, and so see if we can piece together a series of events um, that cause that, uh, that life to die out, OK? Um, and so. What might have caused the mass extinction at 65 million years ago? What do you think? Was it an impact event, flood volcanism, sea level fall, climate change, some combination of the above? 
from what you know already. Okay, let's take a look and see what people think. Oh, you're all too clever for me, damn it. Okay, so yes, some combination of all of the above is very likely to be the case. I thought I was gonna catch you out, oh well. So, yes, our, our, um, our big extinction event, um, which is the Cretaceous Tertiary Boundary, it's often called the KT event, was 65 million years ago. We lost maybe 80 to 90% of the species. Basically anything above 25 kilograms or something didn't survive. So this definitely killed off a lot of the dinosaurs. Um, in the ocean, it was also pretty devastating. So we saw um, simultaneous extinctions in the land and in the ocean. Um, and it's extremely rapid. The more evidence we get, there seems to be this very rapid disappearance of species. Okay? But it is a little bit controversial because we also see a decline in, in species for quite a bit of time before that. Um, so it's not necessarily the whole story, but when we had a look around, we saw a giant impact crater. Um, so if you've heard of the Chicxulub crater, it's off the Yucatan Peninsula. Um, and this is a pretty substantial um, impact crater. It would have uh, exploded with, again, I, as I said, sort of two million times the energy of the most powerful bomb we've ever exploded on Earth. It also landed in water. Um, and how high do you think the tsunamis might have been that were generated by this uh, meteor? In meters, because I only work in meters. 500? 500? Higher. 1,000? Higher. 2,000. 2,000? Higher. <laughs> Not quite that much. Probably five kilometers. So the tsunamis locally around this impact crater might have been five kilometers. So yeah, you're not gonna live through that, okay, if you're life on land at that point. And you can see big tsunami deposits sort of left behind in the landscape all around here. So associated with this, we have this blast wave, we have probably enormous fires, we can find soot deposits around the world at this time that probably sort of caused, or was caused by a lot of huge fires. Um, we also probably saw a collapse of ecosystems both in the ocean and on land because it blocked an awful lot of sunlight. Um, and then we also saw very intense warming. But it's not the whole story because at the same time at about uh, or just before we had this impact, we also had this big flood volcanic event going on. So in the sort of million years or sort of two million years before this impact event, we also had the Deccan Traps which are huge sort of thicknesses of basalt um, in India today. And they maybe cover 500,000 square kilometers and they may be two kilometers thick. So we already had pressure on life. There was already this event that was sort of stressing life. And then we had this enormous impact event which uh, finished everything off really. Um, so it's not necessarily a simple answer. We also had sea level fall um, and associated climate change with the CO2. Okay, so you've already answered my first question correct, so I'm not going to ask you again. But then I wanted to talk about this, because this is a really interesting one. So this is the Permian-Triassic boundary. 95% of all life died out at that time. It's the biggest of our big mass extinction events. Why do you think this one is more difficult to look at and to get answers for what might have caused this? Not a lot of fossils, so there might have been different amounts of life. When was it? It's a lot longer ago. And so, for example, if we look at our ocean floor, we don't have ocean floor that old. So perhaps if we did have an impact crater and it was on the ocean floor, it would have been subducted by now, so we can't see it anymore. So it's actually much more difficult to find evidence for this old. But um, we have a pretty good idea of what might have happened, which is... You saw the Deccan traps last time. The Siberian traps are huge in comparison. They may have covered something the size of the US in lava flows, which can be up to four kilometers thick. Um, and that's an, a, just a crazy amount of lava, and that had a huge effect 
on the Earth. It was already a really hot time in the Earth's history, and so that extra CO2 that it put in um, would have raised temperatures considerably. We may have gone over 40 degrees Celsius, so over 120, I think, Fahrenheit at the equator at that point, and life just couldn't cope with that. At the same time, that lava flow just didn't release CO2 by itself. It erupted through giant coal beds and set those coal beds on fire, which released even more sort of dust and soot and CO2 into the atmosphere. Um, our global temperatures rose by over 6 degrees Celsius. And that sounds a lot, but it's sort of the upper limit of what we might be anticipating at the end of this century, but we'll see. And the whole of the oceans became completely stagnant. We lost oxygen throughout the whole of the oceans. In fact, we probably had nasty, sort of toxic hydrogen sulfide releasing bacteria right into the surface ocean at this time. So ocean life just didn't stand a chance. Um, and it became really acidic and a very toxic environment. So the Permian-Triassic boundary is a fascinating event in Earth's history because it shows what can go wrong, really. It shows sort of the damage that can be done. So my question for you guys is, are we living through a sixth mass extinction? We have had an enormous effect on biodiversity on uh, the Earth due to hunting, over-harvesting, over overfishing, deforestation, changing our habitats, Pollution, we've been introducing exotic species which has destroyed different biodiversity. Um, we're going to see probably significant climate change and sea level change in the future. Our background extinction rate before us was 15 per year. What do you think our extinction rate might be today in our tropical forests? Give me a number. 100? Go up. 200? Go up. 1,000? Go up. 27,000 per year, okay? That's our estimated, because obviously we haven't counted a lot of the species there, that's our estimated extinction rate in tropical forests. So we're having an enormous effect on the extinction rates on Earth, and it's not probably a surprise to anyone. Which of these do you think is the most likely to go extinct? Which of these are we most likely to lose? <laughs> Couple more seconds. Right, let's see what you think we're most likely to lose. <coughs> see? Yes, our poor old panda. Partly is mo he's not really interested in re reproducing at all. Okay, just a couple more minutes, guys. Shh. Okay. Why is that one more vulnerable than the others? Requires more, it's bigger, it's more specialized, it reproduces much more slowly. In the case of pandas, if at all, they're just not really interested in sex, it seems. And so, really our most vulnerable species are these exotic, highly specialized, big organisms. And these other more generalized ones, that things like rats, grass, things that can do well um, and sort of reproduce quickly are probably fine. So the last thing I wanted to mention today was, we are not at the end of evolution. Life is going to continue on Earth for billions of years still to come. And I think it's a really fun exercise to think about what that might be, what might be left after humans. So there's this really cool website there where they got a bunch of paleontologists together and they set them the challenge of working out what life would be like in five million time, years' time, in a hundred million years' time. So it's really fun. Go take a look. So on Friday, biogeochemical cycles.